Should Christians Celebrate Christmas? It's become popular to say that most Christmas holiday traditions come from the pagan world. This week on Creation Magazine Live, is Christmas based on pagan traditions? Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Thomas Bailey. This week we're going to tackle a subject that has become popular recently. People both inside and outside the church are saying that Christmas and most of the traditions that go along with celebrating Christmas have a pagan origin. That's right. Yes, things like celebrating on December 25th, Santa Claus, the Christmas tree, gift giving, uh, it's become fashionable recently, like on social media, for example, to say that Christians should not be involved in these celebrations or these activities. So we'll, we'll talk about all these kinds of things today on the show. Some even object to us, Creation Ministries International, using the word Christmas since it's not in the Bible. Right. Now, we certainly do want to conform all of our thinking to Scripture, both as individuals who work at CMI and as a ministry in general. For everything that our scientists and speakers teach on, we do have a system in place to ensure that the information you get from CMI is both biblically and scientifically accurate. That's right, yeah. So there is a concern when we're accused by Christian brothers and sisters of not following Scripture. Consider 2 Timothy 3 where it says, "...and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus." All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This implies that Scripture contains all the doctrine and moral law we need. Right. So everything we need for our faith and life are either written in Scripture or can be logically deduced from Scripture. Mm -hmm. So if something is sinful, it will be forbidden by Scripture, either expressly or by logical deduction. And that also means if something is not forbidden by Scripture, then it's permissible. Right, yeah, and Christmas is an example of that. Scripture neither commands nor forbids it, so Christians have the freedom in Christ to celebrate or ignore it, as long as the, the means of celebration are not unscriptural. But some critics claim that Christmas violates Scripture because it comes from paganism. Right. First, even if this were true, this commits the genetic fallacy the error of trying to disprove a belief by tracing it to its source. For example, German chemist Friedrich Kekulé thought up what turned out to be the correct ring structure of the benzene molecule after having a dream of a snake grasping its tail. But chemists don't need to worry about correct snake biology or dream psychology to analyze benzene. <laughs> That's right, yeah. And in the same way, the rightness or wrongness of these Christmas celebrations is independent of the truth or falsity of, of their supposed pagan parallels. Now, most importantly, the truth of Christianity depends on the historical facts of the incarnation and the resurrection of Christ, not on Christmas traditions. Right. And as we're about to see, the claim that Christmas is based on pagan tradition isn't supported by history anyway. That's right, yeah. And many of the alleged pagan parallels actually post-date Christianity. They came after Christians were already celebrating Christmas. So the pagans borrowed from Christianity, not the other way around. So let's start with the celebration itself on the date of December 25th. The acknowledgement of Jesus' birth on this date by Christians goes back at least as far as A.D. 202. Right. For example, Hippolytus of Rome, in his commentary on the book of Daniel, wrote, for the first advent of our Lord in the flesh, when he was born in Bethlehem, eight days before the Calends of January, that would be December 25th, the fourth day of the week, Wednesday, while Augustus was in his 42nd year, 2 or 3 BC, but from Adam 5,500 years. He suffered in the 33rd year, eight days before the Calends of April, that would be March 25th, the day of preparation, the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, 29 or 30 AD, 
while Rufus and Rubellion and Gaius Caesar for the fourth time and Gaius Cestius Saturninus were consuls. Ooh, well done. Uh, quite a lot of uh, historical data there. So at that time, AD 202, December 25th was already held as the birthday of the incarnate Christ. And we'll add more details to that in just a minute. Half a century ago, Nobel Prize winning biologist Sir Peter Medawa made a startling comment. He declared that the survival of a child in a mother's womb contradicted immunological laws. Since the immune system normally detects foreign tissue and attacks it, you'd expect the mother's immune system to attack the genetically distinct child within her. Well, we now know that it actually does, but the baby survives by putting up a very specific defence. Researchers at the Medical College of Georgia discovered that mammalian embryos produce a special enzyme that suppresses the mother's killer T-cell action. A human embryo starts to produce this enzyme just before it attaches to the mother's uterus. This refutes a major argument used to support abortion, that the embryo is just a part of the mother's body to do with as she pleases. The research clearly shows that the human embryo is distinct from its mother from the beginning. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. If you've just tuned in, this week we are talking about the claim that Christmas is based on pagan traditions. Right. History records that in AD 202, the December 25th date was already hailed as the day Christ was born. That's right, yes. The concern that some people have is that that date is the date of the Roman celebration of Sol Invictus, or Unconquered Sun. Therefore, Christmas came out of this pagan celebration, but that's not the case at all. And why is that not the case? <laughs> well, because the uh, Christian celebration came before the Roman one. Yes. It, it wasn't until 72 years later, in AD 274, that Roman Emperor Aurelian proclaimed a celebration of Sol Invictus. On top of that, there's no clear evidence that any actual celebrating took place on this date until A.D. 354. Yes, yeah, one article calculating Christmas concludes, Thus, December 25th, as the date of Christ's birth, appears to owe nothing whatsoever to pagan influences upon the practice of the church during or after Constantine's time. It is wholly unlikely to have been the actual date of Christ's birth, but it arose entirely from the efforts of early Latin Christians to determine the historical date of Christ's death. And the pagan feast, which the Emperor Aurelian instituted on that date in the year 274, was not only an effort to use the winter solstice to make a political statement, but also certainly an attempt to give a pagan significance to a date already of importance to Roman Christians. Very interesting. So clearly the pagan date is the copycat, not the original. Yes. So no, the December 25th date is not based on a pagan celebration. But this leads to a question of historical accuracy. Was Jesus actually born on December 25th? Well, the answer is not likely. <laughs> so, so the plot thickens a little bit because the, the next logical question is, right, why then was December 25th chosen by the early Christians to celebrate the birth of our Lord? Well, it's not just an arbitrary date. There is some mm. thinking that went on to arrive at that date. It comes from an extra-biblical, that means outside the Bible, Jewish tradition called the integral year. It's the idea that a prophet's lifespan would be an exact number of years, no additional days or weeks or months. In other words, he would die on an anniversary of his conception, which is the real beginning of life. Right, that's right. Human life begins at conception, not at birth. So Jesus' death was calculated as March 25th by the Western Church. So this same date was celebrated as the date Christ was conceived. Yeah. Then just add on nine months from conception to birth, and that puts Jesus' birth on December 25th. Right. So there's the reasoning behind choosing December 25th to celebrate this incredible event of God taking onto himself the nature of one of his creations, a human. That's right. And there's the tie into creation. Yeah. Some of you might be wondering <laughs> why we're talking about Christmas when we normally discuss issues related to creation, evolution, and science. Well, Jesus is the creator. That's right, yes. At Christmas, churches often read the early chapters of the Gospels, usually Matthew and Luke, but it's the Gospel of John that goes the furthest back. Matthew and Luke tell us about the, the conception and birth of Christ. John goes way further back to long before he was conceived. 
it actually reaches further back than even Genesis does. Genesis 1 records the account of the creation of the space-time universe. Yes. But John 1 tells us that Jesus and the Father existed before creation, before time, in eternity past. Yeah. Let's just take a couple of minutes here for an interesting rabbit trail, because this is really <laughs> cool. John calls Jesus the Word, or in Greek, the Logos. Okay, and why does John call Jesus the Word? <laughs> Well, I'm glad you asked. Okay. It comes from the Jewish concept of the Memra. This teaching can be found in the Targums. Those are Aramaic paraphrases of the Old Testament. Where the Old Testament says something is done by God, the Targums often said it was done by the Memra of God. The rabbis never tried to explain this paradox because the Old Testament also sometimes describes several personages simultaneously as the Lord Yahweh who is one. Okay, so, so that's a reference to the triune nature of God, isn't it? Exactly. They taught six things about this memra. Now, here's the cool part. John 1 identifies Jesus of Nazareth as the embodiment of all aspects of the memra. That is cool. And, and when we come back, we'll look at John chapter 1 and show you that all of those aspects of the memra pertain to Christ. Genesis Verse by Verse is a Bible study tool available on CMI's website designed to help pastors, students, and laymen alike study the book of Genesis like never before. And it's completely free. Simply look up any verse in Genesis 1 to 11, or just scroll down the page. The center column provides links to articles that answer common questions pertaining to that verse and the topics that naturally arise from them. Visit creation.com to use it today. On this week's episode, we're talking about Christmas. Is yes. it based on a pagan holiday? No. And actually, you know, all we've done so far is look at why we celebrate Jesus' birth on December 25th. We haven't gotten very far. Okay, all right. Well, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get there. Let, let's finish up with aspects of the memra that you, that you just mentioned and how they come to fruition in Christ. Then we'll move on to talking about Christmas trees and Santa and presents and, and all that other stuff that's often assumed to be of pagan origin. Okay. Let's list the six aspects of the Memra, and you'll see them mirrored in John 1. The first aspect of the Memra is that he is sometimes with God, sometimes the same as God. Okay, that's the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He is the agent of creation. That's verse 3 of John 1. All things were made by him or through him, and without him was not anything made that has been made. He's the agent of salvation. That's down to verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to them that believe on his name. He's the agent of revelation. And that's mirrored in verse 18 of chapter 1. No one has seen God at any time, only the begotten of God, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. He is the means by which God became visible. You see that in verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he is the means by which he made his covenants. And that's in verse 17. Uh, the law was given by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So there's the really cool rabbit trail. Yes. Now let's talk about other Christmas traditions that are sometimes questioned as to their Christmas connection or Christian connection. Santa Claus, for example, is seen as a secular or pagan addition to the celebration of Christ's birth. Right, yeah. And, well, Santa Claus is based on a real person. The name Santa Claus is a corruption of St. Nicholas via the Dutch Sinterklaas. And, uh, and, but the thing is, he was no pagan, but a real historical Christian figure. He was the Bishop of Myra in Asia Minor, that's, that's modern-day Turkey, in the 4th century. He was known for his generosity. Hanging stockings comes from an instance where he gave three daughters of a poor man some money for their dowries by putting it in their stockings, which were drying by the fireplace. Yeah, uh, St. Nick is equally famous in his day for defending the deity of Christ very strongly. Uh, one legend suggests that uh, at the Council of Nicaea, he slapped the heretic Arius for his denial of, of that vital truth. And, and there's all kinds of memes uh, about this that make the rounds on social media near Christmas time. Some of them are pretty funny, actually. Of course, the mythology that has grown up around the real St. Nicholas distracts from the Christmas celebration of the Savior's birth. Right. But that's not the fault of the original Nicholas. That's right, yeah. What about gift giving? This originated from both St. Nicholas and the gifts of the Magi. 
Now, now, by the way, they arrived about a year after Jesus' birth, right? Don't, don't place too much emphasis on the movies that show them there. But the thing is, if people are buying gifts for others at this time, again, neither commanded nor forbidden in Scripture, then it seems fair to promote, for example, Creation Magazine or the Creation Answers book as a worthwhile gift. Bible-centered gifts are going to do a lot more good than the latest gizmo or some form of entertainment that, that people often receive at Christmas time. But again, just because Christmas can be a time of excessive commercialization, it doesn't mean that gift giving itself is a bad thing. Right. It's morally neutral and shouldn't be condemned just because some people abuse it. I mean, we don't condemn all food just because some people misuse it, for example, or we don't refuse to drive cars because some people use them to commit crimes. Right, yeah. Now, what about the Christmas tree? That's actually a fairly modern invention that, that again, doesn't come from paganism but it has a connection to Christianity. So where did it come from? In the 16th century, Christians in what is now northern Germany performed mystery plays with an evergreen tree called a paradise tree, which was hung with apples, and one of those apples was plucked. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> December 24th was a traditional name day for Adam and Eve. Now, we can appreciate this link of Christmas to the fall because it, it highlights the whole reason Jesus came to die, according to the New Testament. Right. And by the way, the name day is a day of the year dedicated to a particular saint. Yeah, December 24th was a name day for Adam and Eve. The Christmas tree was introduced to England by Queen Victoria, uh, by, by, her, by her German consort, Prince Albert. That's the origin of the Christmas tree. And actually, many of what we think of as ancient Christmas traditions began in Victorian England just a little over a century ago. They're not that old. Now, some appeal to Jeremiah 10, verses 2 to 4, to prohibit Christmas trees. But this is referring to a tree chopped down to make an idol. And it was written 500 years before Christ was even born. This has nothing to do with modern Christmas trees, which are not worshipped. No. And we'll be right back with more details about the non-pagan origins of our Christmas traditions. Calling someone a flat earther definitely isn't a compliment, yet many people mistakenly believe that in the past the church taught the earth is flat. Historian Jeffrey Burton Russell put this myth to rest in his definitive book Inventing the Flat Earth. He could only find five obscure writers in the first 1500 years of the Christian era who denied that the earth was a globe. What's more, science historian John Heilbrunn documented in his book The Sun in the Church that the church actually supported astronomers letting them use the cathedrals as solar observatories. The Bible itself makes some intriguing references to the Earth's shape. One of the most prominent is in Isaiah 40, where it describes God as sitting enthroned above the circle of the Earth. The Hebrew word used here is kug, which denotes sphericity or roundness. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Our subject this week is, is the celebration of Christmas based on pagan traditions? Now, we've covered a number of things associated with, with Christmas already, so we can confidently answer the question as no, Christmas is not based on pagan holidays or traditions. Now, there's more that we could talk about. For example, what about abbreviating Christmas to Xmas? Okay. Now, it's likely that many anti-Christians do write Xmas to take Christ out of it but they're unaware that this expression is actually a Christian abbreviation for Christ. That's right. Uh, the X was the Greek letter pronounced ki or chi. It's the first letter of Christos. X is an abbreviation for Christ. So it, it, even some of the earliest, uh, like the New Testament manuscripts, abbreviated sacred names. There's a mosaic, for example, from the great Hagia Sophia Cathedral in Constantinople, or modern-day Istanbul in Turkey, uh, see the, the IC and the XC with the wavy lines over them in the top, in the upper right and left there in the picture? That's the short form for Jesus Christ. Now, some critics object to the word Christmas or Christ Mass, thinking that it connects to the Roman Catholic Mass. In reality, the word Mass in both cases comes from the Latin Misa, which originally meant dismissal. But in the Christian world, it took on the meaning of sent out on a mission. So the Christ Mass is the celebration of God the Father sending God the Son on a specific mission to man by becoming one of us. Cool. <laughs> so we hope that you can see there's many Christian traditions that don't have a pagan origin. 
Christians can celebrate our Savior's birth on December 25th or not. Scripture doesn't require us to celebrate it, so if you're uncomfortable with it, don't celebrate. Now let's change gears a little to talk about the star of Bethlehem. There have been many attempts to uh, explain the Christmas star scientifically, and we can cover three of them quickly. Some scholars think the star was a comet. Traditionally, comets were associated with important events in history, like the birth of kings, for example. But records of comet sightings don't match up with the Lord's birth. Halley's Comet, for example, was visible in 11 BC, but the first Christmas took place around 5 to 7 BC, somewhere in there. Others think the Star of Bethlehem was a conjunction or gathering of planets in the night sky. Since planets orbit the sun at different speeds and distances, they occasionally seem to approach each other closely. But multiple planets don't look like a single light source as described in Scripture. Also, planetary alignments, are, they happen pretty often, so they're not that unusual. There was a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in 6 BC, but there was an even closer gathering in 66 BC, which is way too early. Finally, an exploding star or supernova has been proposed to explain the Christmas star. Some stars are unstable and explode with a bright blaze. But historical records don't indicate a supernova at the time of the Lord's birth. So all three explanations for the star of Bethlehem fall short of what was predicted in Numbers 24, 17, as well as what then happened and was recorded in Matthew 2. Now, there are two details about the star that are worth noting. First, the text implies that only the Magi saw the star. Comets, conjunctions, and exploding stars would have been visible to everyone on Earth. That's right, yeah. And second, the star went before the Magi and led them from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, a distance of about six miles, in a direction from north to south. But, and, and there's two, two problems here, not only does every natural object in the sky move from east to west, uh, because of the Earth's rotation, but it's very difficult to imagine how any natural light could lead them to a particular house in Bethlehem. So the logical conclusion is that the Star of Bethlehem cannot be explained by science. Right. It was a temporary supernatural light. That's right. Yeah, God used special heavenly lights to guide people before, like the glory that filled the tabernacle that's recorded in Exodus uh, 40 there, and in the temple in 1 Kings 8, also in Acts 9, we read the account of a bright light that shone on the Apostle Paul. You remember that account. These visible signs of God's presence are known as the Shekinah glory. Now, the great mystery of the first Christmas isn't the origin of its special star. It's the question of why the Magi were chosen to follow the light to the Messiah. Right. Today, we're given the same invitation. Yes. Each Christmas provides an opportunity for us to focus on the miracle of God taking on a human nature to save sinners. That's right. And we'll be right back after a short break. What are the theological consequences of adding millions of years to Genesis? How does it impact doctrines such as the gospel, sin, the atonement? Refuting compromise is the most powerful biblical and scientific defense of a straightforward view of Genesis. Loaded with scientific support for a recent creation in six real days, it demolishes all attempts to twist the biblical text in order to insert millions of years, bringing clarity into an area usually mired in confusion. Must reading for Bible college students and anyone involved in church leadership or teaching. Get your copy at creation.com. Okay, welcome back. Well, we had a fun time talking uh, so far about the origin of various Christmas traditions. Christmas traditions in include a lot more than just family get-togethers and presents and decorations. Every year, the holiday season, I mean, it seems to bring out articles and an occasional book yeah. attacking the historical accuracy of Christ's birth. And at Easter time, actually, it's the same. Around Easter time, you get articles and and the occasional book attacking the, re the death and resurrection of Christ. But at Christmas time, this is what we get. That's right. We can pretty much expect this kind of thing. Yes. Now, for example, we hear statements like, contrary to the Gospel of Luke, Quirinius did not govern Syria until AD 7. Right. Or Rome left no records of the census described by Luke. Mm -hmm. Or the story of a virgin birth was borrowed from pagan myths. Yeah. Or the story of the Star of Bethlehem contradicts the evidence of astronomy. We've already dealt with that yeah, one. Yeah, we just dealt with that one. Ever heard these comments before? <laughs> Seems like every year, again, the skeptics haul out these old challenges that have been refuted long ago 
to scriptural authority right around Christmas time. If you're watching this show at Christmas time, you can go online and probably see some of these things. So, do you know how to answer these questions? That's a good question. See, all of these questions have one thing in common. Their answers require knowledge of real history. A little bit. It's yeah. impossible to answer the critics fully without knowing something about the life and times of Jesus Christ, our Savior. That's right. Yeah. Now, this doesn't mean that we all have to be you know, top-level historians to defend our faith. There are some miraculous events in the Christmas story that are beyond natural explanation. The virginal conception, for example, that needs to be taken by faith. There's no natural way to explain that. But Christmas is a good time for Christians to read up on the historical background to what's been referred to as the greatest story ever told. And we've said this before, a good place to go for answers to the skeptics' attacks is creation.com. There we go. For instance, the article, The Virginal Conception of Christ by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, thoroughly refutes skeptical objections to miracles, the Roman census, alleged contradictions in scripture, intentional omissions in the genealogies that are listed in Matthew, and the supposed pagan origin of Christmas. Right, yeah. Those articles provide much of the content actually for today's show. Other helpful articles can be located by beginning at the Q&A page where you'll find dozens of topics listed. Click on the topic, Jesus Christ. There you'll find real answers to attacks made on the authority of God's Word. And you can look at other topics there as well, all kinds of different topics listed there. Right. See, it's very important that Christians, both young and old, understand how to defend their faith. Yes. The same type of tactics that are used to undermine the historical accuracy of the six-day creation and Noah's flood are used to attack the life of Christ and the hope of the gospel. It's not only a duty, but a privilege and a joy for soldiers of Christ to learn more about the master they serve, including yeah. the history, geology, and astronomy that support his word from the very first verse and to arm themselves for the fight against the enemy. Right, yeah, arm yourselves for the fight against the enemy, but there's the additional benefit when you do that of, of just having a more solid faith. Mm -hmm. I remember my background, I was very shaky in my faith growing up until I was in kind of my mid-20s when I started studying what's called apologetics, which means giving a reasoned defense for Christianity. Christmas time is a great time to delve into a bit, little bit of apologetics. Um, great time to do that. That's right. And as we mentioned before, a great gift idea would be Creation Magazine. Yeah, you can, there we go. You can send that to anybody you know anywhere around the world. And uh, it's a great way of getting some of these answers to people that you know that might have some of these questions that, uh, that yeah. we've covered already. Yeah, if you want to view a free online digital copy, go to creation.com slash free mag. You can see a digital copy displayed there. You can flip through it. If you like it, subscribe. You can send a gift subscription, as you just said, to anywhere in the world. Now, this, this has been a fun show to do, yeah. but uh, we'll be back <laughs> next week. And remember, Christianity is an evidence-based faith. And science supports Scripture.